Today on Rock and Recovery, we will be talking to Ryan Hampton, author of The American Fix, and also Michael Gallipo, one of the New York State leads for the Recovery Advocacy Project. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching Rock and Recovery this week. Today, my special co-host is the rump. me, <laughs> Carly Halsizer. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome to the Rock and Recovery Talk Show, featuring Carol Michelle Holsizer. We have a very special guest today on the show. Michael, would you introduce yourself, please? My name is Michael Gallipo. I'm a person in long-term recovery, and I'm a state lead for New York for the Recovery Advocacy Project. What is the New York Recovery Advocacy Project? The New York Recovery Advocacy Project is a grassroots, community-led, um, political advocacy arm of the recovery community and it involves mobilizing and empowering and educating people from the recovery community across New York State to have a part in the process of deciding on policies, programs, and funding priorities that offer opportunities to um, further recovery efforts in communities across New York State. And is also a part of a larger fabric of a national organization that's also called the Recovery Advocacy Project, which has chapters in all 50 states. In all 50 states, that's cool. The way that we focus on doing this is using a bottom-up approach by providing education, opportunities, and mentorship to people who are interested in advocating for meaningful change in their communities at the local level. At the state level, we work together as communities, and at the national level, we work with a national advocacy organization to elevate needed changes at the various different levels of systems change. So you have an event coming up on May 13th. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is? Yeah, so we're hosting our first recovery town hall and the focus of this being our first town hall is, you know, first to engage as many people as we can from the recovery community um, from across the state and to start to answer some very basic questions to develop our political strategy and platform. Um, some of those questions being, you know, what are some of the issues that people have been seeing in their community before COVID-19? What are some issues that have kind of arisen um, in response to COVID-19 or may have been exacerbated by COVID-19 and then really sticking to those, you know, recovery principles of staying solutions focused that we're gonna try to find some solutions and then develop a sense of our priorities as a recovery community across the state. You know what I love about that? Tell me if you love this. <laughs> I love that this is not a meeting you go to so that somebody from a podium could lecture you on what you should do, um, especially when that somebody doesn't have a clue about being in recovery themselves. I like the idea that it's like an open platform for people to say, this is what we need mm -hmm. from life experience. I agree. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Michelle. I mean, we do have a couple of experts that will be joining us that will help shape the conversation a little bit. But you're right, the vast majority of our program is focused on really listening to what people have to share, you know, based mm -hmm. on their experiences, um, really with what's going on, you know, on the ground um, in the state, and then allowing that, that information, that feedback to have a vehicle to get communicated back to our stakeholders, to our legislators, and to key decision makers. And so part of the reason for involving some of the, the qualified experts that we've brought on for our first town hall, um, the two examples 
that I'll use are Ed Niger, who's an attorney who's working on the Purdue bankruptcy case, and also um, Garrett Haid, who's one of our national organizers, who's also working closely with the Victims Ad Hoc Committee for the Purdue bankruptcy filing, mm -hmm. to be able to have a communication directly with folks that are working at a very high level to resolve um, some major systems issues and get reparations for our community. And so this is an opportunity for our community to have a real voice at the table in, in as far as directing those resources where we feel we need them most. I don't know about you, but I go to a lot of meetings and it seems like a lot of them I spend just spinning my wheels or it's the same thing over and over again and it stops at the end of the meeting. It doesn't go forward and you can't like follow it through to, to have some type of a, a great conclusion at the end. So what makes this different? So what makes this different is, is two kind of defining characteristics. So one is, you know, the process of community buy-in and the establishment of recovery advocacy has really taken a much more longitudinal approach to our organizing. So we have ongoing trainings that are facilitated by our national partnership. Those trainings are open and available to anybody who's interested in bringing recovery advocacy to their community. So there's ongoing technical assistance, there's ongoing education that happens on a monthly basis. Um, we continue to meet as state leads on a weekly basis for now. So we're going to continue to do that to continue to build momentum behind this. And then one of the stated goals that we have for our, our first town hall is to actually you know, have as a takeaway some specific working groups that people can sign on to and join. And those working groups will establish their own schedule of activities to continue furthering um, the next steps of our mission and the outcome of the town hall. Wow, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm excited about that. I love work groups. <laughs> you know, and who, who better knows the needs of the community and who's got better ideas than the recovery community to come up with the solutions for it? Yeah, I mean, there's a certain insight that lived experience brings. And as our systems have really grown to um, accommodate that and really recognize the value of having consumer buy-in and having that, you know, direct experience to practice, you know, incorporating peer service models was, was a, a valuable first step. Um, now Oasis has recently announced a recent mandate to adopt person-centered treatment. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that's been consistent, at least in terms of uh, clinical interventions, um, is that a self-directed course of treatment, so pro promoting agency and autonomy in people who have been underprivileged or, or disadvantaged in, in different ways, is the single most powerful predictive factor for positive clinical outcomes in a course of treatment. And when you broaden that to more broader like social ideas, we see similar trends of belief around civil rights reform, around you know racial and restorative justice, um, criminal justice reform. And we find that programs that promote better agency and autonomy um, are much more effective and also in the long term um, produce much more long-standing results, right? So having that community buy-in right from the very beginning is absolutely critical to be able to continue to, you know, drive the kind of results that we're looking to really see in our community. Because there's a ripple effect of recovery advocacy is that this affects much larger than just our, our community of people directly in recovery, that the ripple effect of people turning their lives around and really living in power lifestyles is, is that, you know, it improves the overall conditions of each community, right? And it makes people in society happier and more productive and more peaceful. And one of the lessons that we've learned more recently, you know, in light of COVID, we've had some time to kind of reflect on this idea of interconnectedness, that when we offer people in our society who have been, or at least some time in their lives, some of the most disadvantaged, an opportunity to turn that around and you know become empowered and to have opportunities um, that we see the overall trajectory for our society take a very positive trend mm -hmm. and right now I think that that message of hope 
is something that's extremely powerful for us to bring to people who right now are maybe struggling with self-isolation, maybe struggling with adapting to new ways of doing things in our recovery community. So this is a way for us to also bring that message back to the front as well, that you know we do have the ability to turn things around. And if some of us who had struggled with substance use in some of the most hopeless and, and dire circumstances can really turn our lives around and to produce results like this, then we can certainly find ways to do the same thing in response to COVID-19. Well said. <laughs> Bravo. I want to clap. Stay with us. We'll be right back with more information on the New York State Recovery Advocacy Project and the virtual town meeting coming up on May 13th. As a, as a group, the, you know, people with substance use disorder have been marginalized and the stigma against us is huge. And I'm so happy that this gives us an avenue where we can unite and actually make a difference. Um, a lot of other groups have united and they've made change, but it seems like we've been really slow to come around to this. And I'm like, yes, finally, it's about time. Mm -hmm. And I love that this is just the beginning of it. If somebody wants to get involved, they, it's not like they're going into something that's already established. It's all new. So everybody's opinion is really important to find out what the needs are and work on solutions together. Yeah, I think what you touched on is really important and that the, the issues that are elevated to the state level, it's important to highlight this difference you know, because of our commitment to being, you know, really uh, grounded in grassroots community advocacy, that the needs of each community are elevated and prioritized. And so communities can identify having different needs and they have every right to do that. And we're gonna work with them and empower them and get them the tools that they need to make those changes in their community. Because every one of our community has different needs you know the needs of you know people who are living in manhattan or brooklyn new york city um are inherently going to look most likely very different than you know folks who are living in a community like woodstock where i live you know and so we want to make sure that we can honor and celebrate that diversity within our movement and i think one of the things that i'm the most excited about you know by reaching out to partners like Brooklyn new york and friends of recovery we have an opportunity to really unpack like what is the story of stigma what is the story of you know criminalization and the drug war you know how is it that we're all affected in this in this way very similarly and whether you're a person in long-term abstinence-based recovery or whether you're a person who's practicing harm reduction or medical maintenance um, that we can all you know talk about the issues that we have been affected by together and come together as a community focused on our own empowerment and recovery and be able to frame those issues in a way from a rights framework that we can all come to an agreement and actually forge a solid cohesive coalition. Um, and I think that opportunity to pitch a bigger tent is really what makes me the most excited because now we're talking about things that can really make a difference for people who really need it. Yes, absolutely yes. Do you have any questions for our friend Mikey? No, I think we covered like all the major things. I really like um, how, you know, in, in our discussion with all of this, it's just another on-ramp for advocacy, for people to get involved and to use their voice um, and to use that lived experience like we were talking about. So I'm all about a good on-ramp for that. <laughs> and I love advocacy, so this is this is nice. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and it's, it's wonderful, I, you know, that I feel as we move forward, like so many people's narratives from diverse experience are having an opportunity to be elevated that, you know, women like yourselves who, you know, have, you know, been involved in this work have an opportunity to have your, your stories and your narratives elevated 
in a society that hasn't necessarily um, done that as well as it could. Mm-hmm. And I think we have an opportunity to really reinvent what real equity looks like in our society and restorative justice that, you know, people from different ethnic backgrounds have an opportunity to really hear, you know, have their issues heard and really hear from other groups what they're encountering and to be able to build a bridge of common understanding, Mm -hmm. to be able to actually reach across the table, you know, through meaningful personal relationships and embrace diversity in a way that we really have struggled to do here in America and using our recovery principles, we have the tools to be able to model for the rest of our society what we, we want to see look forward. Like we have the power to create that future within our own community and to allow that, you know, that message of hope, that inspirational quality of recovery to potentially transform the United States of America. And, and I think that's what excites me the most. This is so much bigger than what we're doing right now, but it starts with what we're doing right now. We need some music in the background and people like holding up the flag when you say that. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I almost, I was almost about to go da 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 da, but that's, that's oh Canada. That's <laughs> <laughs> we, we understand. We, you get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's really awesome. And um, now when we voice our concerns at this May 13th event, it's going to be pretty much us talking to us, right? So if we're talking to like people, other people who are in recovery, we know that every voice is important and nobody's going to be shushed at the event, right? That's correct. Every, every voice is valid, and, and what's important is that we are going to have people who have differences of opinion. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important to not um, back away from that. I think that we need to have courage and really display, again, going back to those recovery principles, practicing acceptance, really being present to what somebody else's experience might look like. You know, especially if that person doesn't look like you, they're going to have a different experience and it's okay. There's room to accommodate difference of experience. Stay with us. We'll be right back with more information on the New York State Recovery Advocacy Project and the virtual town meeting coming up on May 13th. Hey everybody, this is Ryan Hampton with the Recovery Advocacy Project and I'm so excited uh, to tell you a little bit about what we do and who we are. Um, Thanks so much for joining. Um, Recovery Advocacy Project was founded about a year and a half ago to help inspire communities and coalitions locally uh, to take on the addiction uh, crisis in their own hometowns where people in recovery, where family members who are impacted, where supporters, where allies who know that solutions to the addiction crisis lie with you. Uh, They rest with you. They're with the people who are involved, the people who are impacted, the people with lived experience. And our goal through RAP uh, is to get more people involved, is to get more people to the decision-making tables uh, to help uh, change the trajectory of power. Um, You know, there's a lot of funding that comes from the federal government, uh, but most of that funding trickles down to state and local communities. Uh, And through the Recovery Advocacy Project, we are hoping uh, to empower the recovery voice to help be a part of that power, to be a part of that decision-making process, because you see it in your own hometowns where the gaps in care exist and also where the solutions are. So we here at the team uh, at RAP uh, have dedicated our purpose, our time, our mission uh, to building local infrastructures all around the country and including in New York, uh, where we get more people involved and give them the tools, the training, the technical skills, the leadership development, uh, and the network with other like-minded leaders from all around the country to get the job down, get the job done uh, in their hometown. And I'm so, so excited that New York is such a big part uh, of this initiative. Now back to our interview with Michael Gallipo.
Well, and just think, you know, what power there is when you can sit with another person's experience and not even necessarily understand or agree with it, but just be able to accept that it's important to embrace and support, you know, your fellow human beings, you know, and just as human beings, not even as people in recovery, mm-hmm. right? And to really get that standing for what matters to them is how we foster resilience in our community. You know, practicing like those very basic, you know, ideas of, you know, recovered coaching, like for example, being rooted in motivational interviewing. And what is that? You know, what is that process? And for me, it's just all about rolling with resistance and getting into the space of another person and overcoming my own judgments and my own opinions and putting those to the side to really be present to what somebody else's experience is like and what the impact has been for them. And that space is healing. That space is transformational. So the more we can learn how to do that for each other and celebrate diversity and honor, as C. Carr would call, the multiple pathways, Mm -hmm. um, I think it gets at some of the core issues that we've struggled with as a society. You know, we have one of the most diverse, you know, populations in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, we're a country who have been built by nearly every nation on the planet. And, and we've struggled to, to even really honor and connect with the people who have this land first. I'm a Native American by birth. And, and I think one of the lessons for me in this lifetime being here is that I've needed to be able to embrace my heritage in a way that recognizes and validates and understands the experiences that people who have done really awful things to my ancestors may have done and be able to be compassionate. And to be able to let go of that and move past it and say, you know what, it's it's not going to create the world that I envision for tomorrow. It's not going to create the world in which recovery is, you know, what is prevalent, right? To really have like a recovery focused or a wellness focused society. You know, if I go back to those differences, if I go back to the mistakes that were made, if I can't celebrate and honor like those mistakes are the process that got us to where we are and we wouldn't be where we are if it wasn't for those i think that's one of the most important things for me as a person in recovery that i had to learn how to celebrate like if it wasn't for all the mistakes that i made with my substance use and if it wasn't for the you know relapses that i had and the mistakes that had to be made in that learning process if I couldn't go back and celebrate that and I stayed stuck in a place of resentment, then I wouldn't have had like the, the cloud to be able to move forward. And I wouldn't have that commonality. I wouldn't have that cohesion with other people in my community who've learned how to celebrate doing the same. Mm-hmm. So I think the more we learn to do that with each other and as a group and model that, I think we really have something that can be transformational for, for the entirety of our society. Absolutely. I am so excited about this event coming up. So we can find that on Facebook, right? And we'll also put a link on the Rock and Recovery uh, Facebook page and on Mission Recovery's website. So if anybody's interested, they can always give us a call. If you can't find it, we'll be happy to help you. Thanks for coming on the show, Mikey. Thank you for having me, guys. Bye. Thanks for watching Rock and Recovery this week. We will be back next week with another really good show. Yes, we will. Bye. Bye.